Hey, I'm here in Washington Pass in the North Cascades at about 5,000 feet, and it's uh, pretty nice up here. Getting to be winter, though, even though it's only still uh, early October. Now, let's talk about um, social identity, um, and especially the kind of identity that comes along with social networking applications, and really the Internet in general. We're going to talk about a few different aspects of identity. Specifically, I'll start with your human identity, but this is not a psychology class, so I'm not going to dwell too long on that, but I want to set the stage, or I want to give you some background that you can understand when I say identity, what am I talking about? And we're going to talk about your identity specifically on computers and focus in on this thing called an identifier, which is really the key, the key to understanding your identity. And then finally, we're going to look at a few of, different, few of the different main issues surrounding identity, especially identity on the net. Okay, well, beginning with um, human identity, uh, you know, it's, uh, the best way, I think, to summarize it or to give it to you in just a few words is your identity is who you are. It's uh, when you use the, sta the statement, I am, um, I like, I believe, uh, I, I duel. <laughs> Bad. We're going to cut that one. I'm going to start that one again. So to get us started with this idea of identity, let's talk about your human identity. Now this isn't a psychology class, so we're going to go very, very superficially, but I want to give you some background to get you started. So your human identity is who you are, what you are, how you are, all those questions about yourself. And I think we can, we can put it into three very broad categories. There are some parts of your identity that are you simply because you're human. If you were a gorilla, or you were a monkey, or you were a, um, a chipmunk, you'd have different kinds of identity because of who you are biologically. So that's the most sort of basic idea of who you are. You are a human being. You have two arms, two legs, a couple of hands, eyes, ears on the sides, eyes facing forward because you're a predator, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Those are all the things that make you who you are and are uh, pretty much unchangeable because you're a human being. Then up from there, we can, we can talk about a personal identity. Your identity, that's who you are specifically, who you are inside that you would be regardless of where we put you on Earth. Now, these are fairly controversial issues. We're getting into the ideas of, of nature versus nurture, and certainly there's no conclusions about that. But I think it's pretty clear to me, at least, that there are some parts of who you are, you might call them your innate personality or whatever, some parts of your identity that are immutable even no matter where you're put. And they do these twin studies, for example, where they have people who are genetically identical, um, and they find that there's a lot of parts of them, a lot of pieces of their identity, things that are important to them as people that are the same, regardless of where they, where they grew up or what their experience is. And so I would summarize these things about you as answers to the question of I am, I like, this is what I do, this is how I perceive the world, this is my personality, all those kinds of, of things that are innately you are part of your identity. Then at the wider level, and, and these levels go wider and wider and wider and wider, there are social identities. The identities that you take on because, for example, you're part of a family. Everyone in my family does X. You know, I grew up believing in blah, blah, blah. Those are all parts of your identity that are um, family-based. Then there are community-based identities. You grew up in a certain place. Like, for example, no matter how hard I try, I can't shake the fact that I'm a New Yorker. And people will say to me all the time, oh, you're from New York, right, because of ways that I am, because the ways New Yorkers are. If you were from the South or you were from uh, another country or anywhere in the world, you'd have some part of your identity that's based on the fact that you're from a particular community, an, an ethnic community as well as, a, um, as well as a geographic community. Your profession leads you to have certain parts of your identity. Certainly when somebody asks you about yourself, and um, you may one of the first things you may say is, I'm a student. That's what's defining you, your activity, the way that you're, uh, you're in the world. I'll say that I'm a teacher. Um, people will, will talk about their identity in terms of their profession. They talk about it in terms of their family. They talk about it in terms of their different communities. They talk about it in terms of their nations. I'm an American. I'm a German. I'm a Swede. I'm a Korean, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and each one of those things adds a different part, a different nuance to your identity. Okay, so that's enough background information. I just wanted to give you at least a little bit of a feeling for what the, the general or the bigger idea of identity is. And to say that part of your identity is defined by being a human being, 
part of your identity is defined personally. I am, regardless of other things that are going on me in the, around me in the world, and I am specifically because of the things that are going on around me in the world and the communities that I'm a part of. And all of these, all these different identities overlap. Sometimes you express one, sometimes you express another. But your identity is based on those sorts of factors. All right, so if we're going to talk about um, your identity on the net, your identity inside of computers, there's a concept that we cannot avoid. And it's a huge concept and one that I find really important and one that I want you to come out of this class really, really understanding and embracing and, and, and having as, as something that's inside your head from now on, really. And that's the idea of an identifier. If you have an identity, how do we know whose identity it is? It could be this person's identity or that person's identity or somebody else's identity. The way that we distinguish those things is through the idea of an identifier. Now, what's an identifier? An identifier is some unique token. And when I say token, I mean a string or a picture or something that's specific only to you. And when I see that thing, I know that it's you and nobody else. So just saying it that way raises a whole lot of questions. So let's dive a little bit deeper into this idea of an identifier. First of all, what kinds of things stand as, as an identifier? Certainly if I asked you, um, what would you tell somebody if you wanted to distinguish yourself from other people? First thing I think you would say is, oh, I tell them my name. My name is Bob Boyko. That distinguishes me from all the other people around me. Or does it? The problem with names is that they aren't that great as identifiers. In fact, there's, <laughs> when I joined Facebook, the first person who found me and uh, tried to friend me, and in fact, I think I am friends with this person, is another guy named Bob Boyko. Right? So the other Bob Boyko on Facebook friended me, and, and, uh, and so it's not a unique name. Even though you might think that's a unique name, names are not unique. Um, but they are what we generally use, and to a first approximation, they're unique. But a first approximation is not what we need on the net. An absolute identifier is what we need on the net. Okay, so my, user, my, um, my personal name is definitely not unique, but my username like the username I choose on Facebook or the username I choose on any of the other sites that I visit on the net, that is unique. It's enforced. It's, it's made to be unique by the people who are on the site. If somebody else already has that name, as you well know, like if you ever try to get a Google uh, a Gmail uh, uh, email address, you know that your name, you know, you have to be number 5,672 to get anything that's anywhere near your name. That's because they enforce uniqueness. Why do they enforce uniqueness? Because they're using that username as an identifier. Your personal name is not a good identifier because a lot of people share that name and you can't do anything about that. Your username on computers, however, is enforced to be unique. And we'll talk about how that enforcement happens a little bit later. So in general, though, our identifiers tend not to be names. They tend to be numbers. Your social security number, your telephone number, your passport number, your driver's license number, your credit card numbers, all of those numbers are, um, are unique identifiers, and it's really pretty easy to keep them unique because you can always just choose another number. Right? And, and also, we don't associate those numbers personally to ourselves. We wouldn't give somebody, if they say, oh, I'm uh, Joe, who are you? You might not say, oh, I'm 9576433026. On you know, you're not going to do that. So it's, it's not important for that number to be any number or any other number, and so numbers very often and very easily serve as unique identifiers because there's lots and lots of them. We can always have one number higher. And, um, and because people don't put anything into them that would require them to uh, be non-unique or, or apply to more than one person. So we have names as identifiers used only really in this username idea. We have numbers as identifiers used all over the place, lots and lots of numbers as identifiers. And then we have addresses as identifiers. The idea of an address, and let's start with a, um, with a, a locational address. I say uh, my address is 543. That's my house number. 27th Avenue, that's my street number. Seattle, that's my city. Washington, that's my state. 98764, notice a number, uniquely defining a region in space. United States of America, North America, Earth, solar system, blah, blah, blah. Notice what I'm doing there. Uh, there's plenty of house numbers that are the same as my house number, but no two house numbers on that same street. There are plenty of streets that are the same street as mine but no two streets on that in that city or in that zip code, and then on and on and on. So we're using the fact that we're using a combination of different parts to, to enforce the uniqueness. 
And given, and especially since we have a zip code in there and the, and the, or a postal code wherever you are in the world, uh, the postal code is, was designed specifically to get rid of any of the ambiguity. And if there happens to be two third streets in the same city, then the postal code will disambiguate. Disambiguate meaning uh, show you the difference between one and the other and make it unique. So when we disambiguate, we create uniqueness and that's what a postal code is there to do. But the basic idea of why an address is unique is because it's nested. It's a hierarchy. It's one location inside a wider location inside a wider location. And it's less and less likely that you'll have the same house number if you nest it inside of those larger and larger locations. If I just said my address is 547, well, that could be anywhere in the world. But 547 23rd Street, that narrows it down. Seattle narrows it down even more. Washington narrows it down even more. United States, et cetera, et cetera, until it is pretty much guaranteed to be unique. So the idea of address originally was a geographic address. We could have uh, latitude, latitude and longitude, and that would really nail it down because there's no two places on the planet that have the same latitude and longitude. So that's unique in that sense. Um, but in general, or not in general, but on the web, we have other ways of having addresses and specifically two kinds of addresses on the web that are also unique. Web addresses, sometimes called URLs, and also email addresses. So the email address and the web address actually work in a very similar way to the geographic address. So, I, so uh, uh, a URL might be iSchool.Washington.edu forward slash uh, you know, uh, index.html. Well, there's lots of index.html's index on the web. They're all over the place. That's a very common name for a web page. But if you add all of those other modifiers, and those modifiers are loosely in hierarchical order, from the edu, which is the most general. Edu means educational institution. That's all the educational institutions in the world. So we've narrowed it down. Then we have Washington, which narrows it down even further. That's the, that's the institution inside the, um, the, the educational institutions, Was University of Washington. Then we have iSchool, which narrows it down even further. And that uniqueness is then, then comes about from the exact same way that the uniqueness of your physical address comes about by having a set of qualifiers or a set of more and more general terms that assure that something that is non-unique, like the word index.html, which happens all over the web, is made unique by all those other parts that are tacked onto it. Um, we'll, get to a, we'll, get, we'll get to a bigger issue in a moment about how do we know that there isn't another iSchool.Washington.edu somewhere around, right? How can we be sure that that's unique? Okay, so before we do that, however, let me... Uh, find my way back to my slides here. Um, we also have email addresses. So when, I ha when I'm like bboyko at uw.edu, we have that same idea. There may be lots of bboykos. There may be a bboyko on uh, Hotmail. There may be a bboyko on Gmail. There may be a bboyko on AOL. But there's, not, there's no more than one bboyko at uw.edu. uw.edu. Right? That's another example of that hierarchy of more and more specifics that allow us to say that the bboyko I'm talking about is none of the other bboykos anywhere else on the web. It's that particular one. Okay, so these addresses are made unique. All three of these addresses are made unique by having this hierarchy of generality, more and more general. And when you put all of them together, it's, it's, it's made impossible for there to be more than one of those. And again, we'll come back to why it's impossible for more than one of them in just a moment. Okay, so those are the kinds of identifiers. We have names, we have numbers, and we have addresses. Those are the big kinds of identifiers that we, that we use. And in all cases, as I said before, the identifier is there to say this is authoritatively this object, this person, and no other. So we've only been talking about identifiers for people, but there could be lots of identifiers for other things. For example, every time you look on the back of some kind of piece of machinery, there's a serial number. What's the serial number? The serial number is the way of identifying, uniquely identifying that object, that, that machine, that camera, or whatever it is, as being that one and none other. So we always want to have a way of saying it's that one and none other. Okay, so those are the types of IDs. There are, those, are the, those are the ways that we establish IDs. Um, let me talk a little bit about how we establish the uniqueness of those IDs. How, for example, do I know that when your student number uh, 173654 that there's no other student that has that student ID. Well, one thing that's really easy to do, and this is done quite a bit in databases, is to yes, use sequential numbers and never go backwards. Every time I assign a D, an ID to something, somebody, some student or whatever, I increment the number. I add one to it. 
and I never ever reuse numbers. So every time I have, an, if, I, if, if I have student number 1,000, the next one up is going to be 1,001. If student number 1,000 drops out, I don't go and give that, that number 1,000 to somebody else. I would give 1,002 to the next person that came along. So by always incrementing, by always using the next higher number, I assure that every ID that I give out is unique. Very simple and very effective, um, except if I'm spanning different systems. So for example, if I have um, all the universities in Washington all giving out numbers, they all have to know who, what, what's the next available number, right? Because if I give one out at, at University of Washington, uh, say I give one out at University of Washington, Seattle, and then I give the next number out at University of Washington, Tacoma, they all have to know about each other in order to make sure that the next number is unique. So that's kind of a problem. So we have another way of doing it, and this, this, this is my favorite way, actually, of, of, of creating uniqueness, because it's kind of slick, and um, it's, <laughs> it's interesting to me. And, they, and the idea is to give out a random number. So suppose I said, um, anytime a new student comes into the university, I'm going to give them a random number between 1 and 10. Would that work? Would that give me uniqueness? No, really, not at all. Okay, so I say, okay, between 1 and 100. Does that give me uniqueness? No way. 1 in 1,000? No way. 1 in 10,000? No way. 1 in 100,000? No way. 1 in a million? Most of my numbers are going to be unique. A random number between 1 and a million but uh, I bet you I'm going to have a, a bunch of times where that doesn't work. 10 million, 100 million, a billion, a zillion. You know, uh, we can have numbers larger and larger and larger until we get to the point where it's really almost impossible for us to give the same number twice. And that's the idea of a globally unique identifier, a GUID, uh, excuse me, a GUID, or sometimes called a GUID, and other people call it a GUID. G-U-I-D, Globally Unique Identifier, G-U-I-D. We choose a random number so, uh, uh, we choose a, a, a range of numbers so high that it's almost, in, it's so improbable that we'll assign the same number twice as to be close to impossible and, and guarantee uniqueness. Now think of what's interesting about that is that anybody, anywhere could be generating these unique IDs and no matter who you are, you don't really need to know about anybody else and it's almost guaranteed I would say, you know, for all intents and purposes, it is guaranteed that that's going to be a unique ID. One other thing to know about um, uh, GUIDs is that they don't use uh, digital. They they don't new, they don't use base 10 numbers. So it's not uh, from one to 100 billion. It's a base 16 number. And so when you look at a, a GUID, like you can see on the screen here, you see that it's a combination of numbers and letters. And I don't want to go into the technical details of what the letters mean, but understand that that's still a number. We're just using letters to make it even a bigger number than it would have been otherwise in the same amount of space. All right, so to guarantee uniqueness, we can use sequential numbers. To guarantee, but if we use sequential numbers, everybody assigning those numbers has to be aware of each other. To guarantee uniqueness, we could use random numbers. But we may, better make sure that it's random numbers in a very, very large range. So we create this idea of a GUID. Anybody can apply them. Very, very unlikely that any two people are going to come up with the same uh, number in that, in that random number sequence. Excuse me, in the random number range. And so um, those work very well, but they're kind of clunky. As you can see, this number is enormous and it's a little clunky, right? Or we can do what's very often done and what's done with web addresses. It's done with, uh, it's done with most of your IDs that you use on the web. And that's to have some sort of directory that says, well, if, you, you know, if that one's already taken, we're going to tell you and you're just going to have to choose another one. So when I create a web address, you know, um, bob.com, do you think bob.com is taken? I bet you it is. And I say, I want to have bob.com. The people in charge of the directory, and there are people in charge of the web directory of all URLs, say, sorry, that one's taken. You can be bob9672.com if you want, but you can't be bob.com because it's already taken. There's somebody there with a list, and every time a new person wants an ID, they check that list and they decide whether or not it's okay, whether or not um, you, you're allowed to have that new ID. And that's what happens with web addresses, that's what happens with email addresses. When you go to Gmail and you choose a username or go to anywhere pretty much and choose a an username, first thing they do is they look it up against all the usernames that are there. If it's not taken, fine. If it is taken, um, no way. And then if you add that uniqueness onto the uniqueness of having this hierarchical set of qualifiers like gmail.com, then you see how you can make a complete unique address. Within Gmail, the directory Guarantees, uh, guarantees the uniqueness within Gmail, right? That it's Bob 697 and nobody has that one. Now, between Gmail and all the other 
um, email addresses, all the other email servers, the directory of all of the dot coms dot, you know, it's gmail.com, right? So, um, uh, so the directory, the internet directory guarantees the uniqueness there. We have uniqueness across the web and then we have uniqueness within the server and so, um, so we can have uniqueness of that address. Okay, so why am I dwelling so much on these identifiers? The reason I'm dwelling on the identifiers is because that is who you are. As far as Gmail is concerned, you're Bob673 and anything associated with Bob673 is you. Anything not associated with Bob673 is not you. It's the key to your identity. Let's turn now to your identity specifically within Facebook and look a little bit deeper into this idea of all the data associated with you. We said that your identity for a computer system is your ID, Bob697 at gmail.com and all the data associated with you. At Gmail, all the data associated with you is whatever you filled out when you applied for the email address, you know, your, your real name and um, your address and your phone number or whatever else it is you gave Gmail. Um, and that's a very small amount of information plus all the messages that have you as their identifier. So in each email message on Gmail, it says this email message belongs to Bob637 and that's how it's associated with you. Not a whole lot of, um, not a whole lot of identity there, right? Not a whole lot of identifying features. Facebook, on the other hand, has a lot of identifying features. And I, I don't know how much of this you filled out. I filled out very little. I played around with it a little bit just to, um, to get up on it for this class. But there's a lot of information about you, things that you can say about yourself. Going back to what I said earlier about who am I? What do I like? What kind of things? Where am I from? What are the different, what are the different things that I would say to describe me? What philosophies do I have? What religion do I have? What were my political views? All these things, all these different aspects of, of your personality, of your identity, are all able to be entered in Facebook. And they are there. They're there to define you, to show who you are. And as I've said elsewhere, once they know all that stuff about you, for example, your religion, well, then the local, the local religious institution that matches you can start to advertise to you on Facebook and say, hey, why don't you come, why don't you come be part of us? We know that you're a Catholic, so here's a Catholic church that's just down the street. We know what your address is because you type that address in, so um, why don't you become part of us? So your identity on Facebook is very particular and very specific. It's, all the, it's your identifier, whatever you, your Facebook user ID is, plus all the information that you've, um, that you've typed in about yourself and then, of course, your social network becomes part of your identity. Part of Bob is that Bob knows Joe. Um, and also all the things that you've liked become part of your identity. All the comments that you're logged become part of your identity. And in fact, as, um, as, uh, as you can see when you uh, listen to the, to the video of, of my interview with Greg Badros from Facebook, for all intents and purposes, that's you. That's who you are. And in fact, in the future, that may become literally who you are on the net. All the things that you've you've typed into Facebook and maybe your Facebook ID is going to become the most important ID of all the IDs that you've created and the one that everybody uses in order to define who you are. So your Facebook identity is very explicit. Your Gmail identity, not very explicit, right? It's just a few pieces of information. But your Facebook identity is big and getting bigger, may become actually in the long run, certainly what Facebook would like to have happen, may become your actual identity, your identity online. Okay, let's talk about some issues in identity. And if there's so many issues in identity, and of course we could have, you know, you could get a major in identity and still not get to the end of the subject. So I just want to raise some of the big ones, some of the ones that are most outstanding that I want you to be aware of and I want you to be able to be conversant in and able to think through and able to have an opinion about in identity. So the first one is this idea of multiple identities. Then we'll talk about how do you link all your identities together or how is it possible to link identities together and how does that happen in reality that your identity on Gmail versus your identity on Facebook or whatever can all come together to make a, a, an Uber identity for you on the web. Um, data mining, what are, what are people using your identity for on the web? And then finally, who owns this identity? Who owns your online identity? All right. Well, let's start with the idea of multiple identities. And I really like this article that's been assigned. So you have, um, you have this is a reading, art, uh, a reading. and um, I don't want to dwell on it because it's there in the reading and, and you can read about it yourself. But I do want to um, point out a few of the, of the parts of this issue, which I think are really kind of interesting and important. And, um, and the first one here is that um, 
your online identity um, can be like you or not like you. Oops, let me get back to my slide here. So when you create an identity, for example, and you all know this, right? You can, you can go into Facebook, create a, fa a fake person, or you can go into Facebook and it's really you, but you say you like, a, um, you like a band that you don't really like or you like a movie that you don't really like. So online, you can mess with your identity. You can have it be as close or as far from you as possible. And the question is to me, and I think it's a really interesting question, one to be pondered, if you go onto Facebook, or even if you're in a conversation and you say, I like you know, this band, Boys to Men, I like, um, but you don't, what does that mean? Does that mean that you want to like them, but you don't? You want other people to think you like them, but you don't? Or maybe that, you know, you actually do like them. Whether you, whether you enjoy listening to their music or not, for all intents and purposes, you like them because you're going to be identified as somebody who likes them. You're going to get ads for, for their concerts. You're going to, um, you know, people are going to share their music with you because you said you like them. And so I think it's a little bit, you know, to say that there's a real you and there's a fake you and you've made a fake you, I, I think that's a little bit problematic because I'm not sure that it's that easy. And uh, again, I don't want to express an opinion on this. I don't want to say there either, either is or is not a real you, but I want you to think about it. And I want you to think about it more deeply than to simply say, there's no such thing as the real me, or there is a real me and these other things are fake. I want you to get a little bit deeper into the issue. Okay, so um, let me see. I don't want to talk about all these different issues, but um, uh, I do want to say this about the identity that you have different identities possible in different places on the web. And people play with this all the time. You know the old saying, you know, no one knows that you're a dog on the web, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I think there may be a, a deeper way of looking at that is to say that uh, your identity itself is not a single thing or may not be a single thing. And in some cases, you, you, you express parts of your identity. In other places, you don't. And we all know this, right? We all know that when you're in class, you act like a student. When you're at a party, you act like somebody else. Or, you know, when I'm teaching, I'm standing up in front of a class teaching, I, ask, I act like someone, like one kind of person. And when I'm, um, you know, out cutting wood at my yurt, I act like someone else. Or when I'm out partying with my friends, I act like a different person. But is that right? Is that the right way to think of it? Or is it, th or is it the right way to think of it that I have a very rich and complex personality, and so do you? And in different contexts, different parts of that, about that personality or that identity come out. So once again, we have a simple way of thinking about it, which is I'm different people in different contexts. Or even simpler than that, some people who say, you know what, no matter where I go, I'm exactly the same kind of person, always expressing the same thing. And there's maybe a richer or more sophisticated or more complex way to think about it, which is my identity is very sophisticated. It has a lot of nuances to it, a lot of different angles to it, and they're all me, but they come out at different times and in different places. Okay, so that's as far into the idea of multiple identities as I'll get because the article that I've assigned to you on this subject, I think, covers it way better than I could, and, um, and I like it very much. All right, let's talk about this issue, the issue of linking your identities. So I, for example, have um, accounts. Oh, I don't know how many places I have accounts. But let's just take two of them. I have an account on Amazon.com, bought tons of stuff off of Amazon.com, and I have this account on Facebook where I've said lots of stuff about myself. Can anybody get my Amazon.com stuff, put it together with my Facebook stuff, and say, oh, this is Bob, and this is Bob. Let's put them together. And how would that happen? So first of all, we've already talked about the way that, the easiest way that it happens, which is all of those things are united by the same unique ID. On Amazon, I use this unique ID. On uh, on Facebook, I use the same unique ID, and so easily that information can be aggregated or brought together. Well, of course, that's not the case. Amazon has their own system. Facebook has their own system, so those two things won't come together. However, I have these other identifiers, maybe, for example, my social security number that I might have given Amazon, which I didn't, or I might have given um, Facebook, which I didn't. But if I had, then I have an identifier that links those two identifiers. So the Bob on Amazon and the Bob on Facebook are linked together by this overall or bigger or larger identifier. And so, um, uh, so if, that was, if that was the case, then Amazon and Facebook could get together and say, hey, we both know that this is the same person. Let's put them together. Or what's more likely, 
Amazon can sell data about me to, um, to company X. Facebook sells data about me to company X. Company X realizes that there's some kind of way of identifying me across those and links those together and makes, begins to make an Uber picture of me. Now this is not, you know, this is not theory. This is what actually happens on the web. People sell your data, people collect data about you, they sell it to each other, it becomes available in some way or another, sometimes it gets hacked. Um, and if there's personally identifying information, things that could be literally tied to you between those two, those, those two bits of information that came from A and B, they will be tied together by somebody very smart who has the tools to look deeply into the data that's collected by different people on the web and, um, and brought together into a, single, into a single profile of you and then used for whatever they use it for. Usually it's used to target advertising to you. Um, so that's one way that we bring things together. Another thing that I want to bring to your attention is um, that sometimes the thing that links you is not text. Sometimes the things that, thing that links you is an image. So I'm not sure if you follow this story, but not so long ago, uh, Google came out with the, um, with, the, with the pronouncement that they are able to do face searches. So I can put a picture into, into Google and based on, the, based on an analysis of the faces in that picture, bring up other information that is of the similar sort. And you've seen this on Facebook as well, right? When you're tagging your, when you're tagging your pictures on Facebook, it zooms in on the faces and it says, hey, is this the same person? Now, how well, how well is that done on Facebook? Mm, you know, reasonably well, actually, reasonably well. It, it usually gets most of the same faces, but it's not 100%, but it will be. And so what I want to say is that it's not just IDs, or what I want to say actually is that your face is an ID. And the ability to recognize your face, as I'm sure you've heard in many different places, is getting better and better. And so your image, even if you have your image in two places, that might be the key to linking your, person, uh, linking your, your profiles and your identities together. Okay, so lots of different pieces, bits and pieces of your identity scattered about the web. Lots of people out there who are very interested in bringing them together, aggregating them, and linking them all into one Uber identity. And then, of course, it'd be up to them to sort out all the different conflicts, right? On one, one site, I'm, I behave one way, and on another site, I behave the other way. So then it's their problem to figure out your multiple personalities and, and what that says about you. Okay, linking you. Now I want to talk about sort of a, a related subject, and that's data mining you. That's making conclusions, drawing conclusions. So I have, the, I have all these profiles, and people have said different things, and what, what conclusions do I draw? So the slide that you see here is um, uh, from uh, a dating site called OkCupid. You probably have all heard of that. Um, and if you've ever experienced OkCupid, they ask you a lot of very, 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 very personal questions about yourself in relation to politics, yourself in relation to sex, yourself in relation to uh, religion, and even stuff like how many times a day do you brush your teeth? I mean, there's all sorts of very personal questions on OkCupid. And as you can see from this slide, they're watching. <laughs> They're watching what people say and they're making conclusions about it. This from, uh, from this site, this is about the only graph that um, is, uh, is uh, G-rated, or not even G-rated. This one is not so G-rated, but the other ones that are on the same page are a lot less G-rated. So you get the idea that this is an example of people watching what you type into the web and making a lot of assumptions about it and, and doing this thing called data mining, which is bringing together information from lots of sources and trying to draw larger conclusions from it. So you're being data mined all the time. People are trying to figure things out and maybe they're figuring it out for benign reasons like research reasons. This is kind of how, how uh, OkCupid presents itself as a research organization. Maybe they're trying to data mine to, to market to you. Maybe they're trying to data mine to figure out how to market in general. The real question and the kind of the debate point in all of this is, is it tied back to you personally? Is it tied back to you particularly or is it kept anonymous? And what you'll hear, oh, hold on a second, about to sneeze. Ah, went away. Um, what you'll hear is, <coughs> <laughs> what you'll hear is that we keep it all anonymous and we never tie it back to you. What I want you to know is that's a matter of trust because certainly it could be tied back to you. So let me give you this example, tying together something I said before. You go on OkCupid and you say, oh, I'm not going to use my real identity. I'm going to use my fake identity. But do you put a fake picture up there? Do you put a picture of somebody else up there? No, because the whole point of OkCupid is for people to see who you are, and so they meet you, you know, whether they like you or whatever. 
Um, and so you put an actual picture of you. Well, face recognition software goes and matches your face to the face of you on some place where you're very well identified and your name and address is there. So now all of this very personal stuff that you typed into OkCupid is linked to stuff that's really about you. And so now all these personal answers are known and they're known to be your personal answers. So I don't mean to, to, to ring alarm bells, that's not my point at all. My point is that you are aggregatable and so you should understand that. You are, um, you, you are identifiable, theoretically, you have to understand that. And so it's really a matter of trust. Do you trust these people not to abuse your information or not? And that's really the question. Not could they because they certainly could. Would they or will they?